we are live all right welcome hey. welcome to everyone um to another live with hanifa nayela i am hanifa nayela and i am here as usual every friday at 5 p.m to 7 p.m today we have a special special guest she is one of my favorite people specifically around this topic my go-to person in my head um and i know this is just going to be a really informative fun um probably heavy in some places conversation because that's just how natasha do and um uh if you guys have any mm -hmm. questions of course you put it in the chat and i will highlight it and if i can get to them because i don't necessarily have a structured um list of questions today mm -hmm. so i think i'm going to be drawing a lot from the audience i'm going to allow other people to also come in um, if mm -hmm. you are not subscribers yet, make sure you, you hit the subscribe button, share it on your platforms, because this is a conversation that we need to have in our community as much as possible. Not once. And then three years later, we need to keep it going, ongoing conversation. So how are you feeling today, Natasha? I'm feeling good. I'm ready for this conversation. I'm always ready for a mental health conversation, but especially in 2022 i think that you know the conversation needs to continue so i'm happy to be here with you why what's so special about 2022 with the um mental health conversation it has been in the beginning of this year we're on day 21. Mm -hmm. in the beginning like the first week of 2022 i actually wrote a date with 2020 mm -hmm. and i looked at it and i was staring at it i'm like what's so odd about it what's so odd about it is my brain, my mind defaulted back to when life was somewhat normal or was a normal that I was accustomed to. Now we have a new normal. And I think after two years of being in a pandemic uh -huh. and in all of the, 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 the crazy making components of adjusting to this new normal and new life, uh -huh. I don't think that we are really and we as a society really paying attention to the emotional and the psychological toll that these last two years have had on us. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm always up for the conversation. Yeah. Um, I'm just going through my comments real quickly. Okay. Um, so I know TJ was here. She usually comes and drop her comment and then circle back around. So peace to TJ. Um, and then Inya, as usual, always supportive, says peace, Hanifa, Natasha. Peace to the chat. Looking forward to this conversation. We have Daryl. He says, hello, Hanifa, and the hello, pretty chocolate woman. Yes, <laughs> Natasha is gorgeous, you guys, okay? Gorgeous and oh, always gorgeous. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thank you. <laughs> and then we have my sister, Ma'at. She says, peace, my sister, and peace to Natasha. So, Natasha, I'm going to jump right into it with you, okay? okay? So, why don't you tell us Tell us a little bit about yourself. And then from there, we're going to go into your journey mm -hmm. around your diagnosis. Because I really okay. want to, to get a picture of that. So tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do. So it all started one day back. No, it's uh, I'm originally from the Virgin Islands, just like you, St. Thomas, yes. Virgin Islands, born and raised. My parents are from Trinidad and Tobago. So I was born and raised in a Caribbean household on a Caribbean island, then I came to the US. I am, I feel sometimes like I'm on my 19th career because I've been fortunate to do a lot of different things mm -hmm. very, very early on. You know, I think our, my first business was when I was 11, mm -hmm. uh, 11 or 12. You know, my parents allowed us to create a business on St. Thomas and we did it at, well, I think it's right now Yacht Haven Marina, but it was the Ramada back then. What was and business? So no laughing, okay? okay? So my mother had a boutique and I, I have two sisters, mm -hmm. one above me and one after me. And so my mother named her boutique after my younger sister, which is Cassandra. So it was Cassandra's boutique. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my older sister and I were like, what are we, chopped liver? Like, okay, we don't get a store, we don't get a business. So my parents allowed us to come up with the type of business that we wanted to have. 
pick the name. So we picked um, in Ramada Yacht Haven Marina. So we had a tourist shop. We sold everything for the beach. And we came up with a name that only parents who love their children would, would make a sign for. So my older sister is Stacy. My name is Natasha. And we named that store Stanasha's. <laughs> we did. And my parents actually made it a sign and business cards and everything for Stanasha's. And we kept that business until my older sister went off to college and then wow. we closed it. So um, entrepreneur, author, wow. speaker, trainer, mental health, educator, advocate, coach, unapologetic veteran advocate. Um, I've been, I've done a lot of things. You are a vet, right? No, I'm not. Oh, I'm not. Why do I always, I always no. thought that. Okay. Because I am such a, an advocate for them. I don't okay. know. Well, I do know why I, I know why I, a lot of my mental health journey was, um, crafted. My recovery was crafted and, and I was mentored by active duty military and veterans. So we can get into that later, but yeah, that's, that's where I hear the, the pit bull comes out. Yeah. If it's something with mental health or if it's dealing with the veterans, with the but vet. I've had, um, yeah, I've had a lot of different careers, uh, modeling, acting, entrepreneur, writer, author, sales, business consultant, lots of different things. So that's me. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, okay. Can you start with maybe telling us what is your, it, it, I can ask, what is your diagnosis? Is that all right to ask? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. What, what is your diagnosis? And then how did you get to being diagnosed? Take me on that journey. Okay. So my diagnoses, as I've got several, yeah. Okay. Um, first was uh, um, bipolar disorder type two, ultradian, uh, which basically means I have, you know, mixed states and a rapid cycle between, you know, depression and hypomania several times a day. Some people do that maybe several times a year or a week or a month, but mine came several times a day. Um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's uh, from a combination of things, one including 9-11, because I was in New York for that, and uh, also, believe it or not, hurricanes, so thunder, lightning, uh, generalized anxiety, panic uh, disorder, and EDNOS, which is eating disorder not otherwise specified. So I had all of those things, and many times people are like, well, Really, Natasha, once you overdiagnose, there's no way all of that could have been in operation at the same time. Okay, you didn't have my life. All of them were in operation at the same time, at different points in my life. And how I came to be diagnosed um, first was with um, depression. And many people who have a bipolar, schizophrenia, schizoaffective diagnosis, usually the first diagnosis is depression because that might be the, the, the first one that, that presents itself. Mm -hmm. And so that was in college for me. And it was a period after I lost um, several people close to me in a short amount of time. And I was, you know, found to be catatonic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did therapy while in college and that was the start right after 9-11 is when I got a lot of the other diagnoses because I was supposed to be at um, arriving at the World Trade Center about 8.45 that day. My modeling agency was around the corner and I had a nine o'clock appointment. And uh, it was just my, my younger cousin who asked me to walk her to school that day. So I called, canceled, you know, my nine o'clock, walked her to school, and on the way back was when I saw cars stopped and, you know, someone waved me over and said a plane flew into the World Trade Center. And it didn't register for me at that point until I got home. And like many other people looked at the TV and like, is this a bad movie that's just playing out? Mm -hmm. So how that affected me is I dealt with survivor's guilt. Mm -hmm. You know, many times when something like that happens, People, your friends, family, they want to offer comfort. And so they say things like, you know, well, God still had a plan for you. You know, there's still purpose left in you. Mm, that may help you, but it doesn't do anything for me. Because now what you're saying is that all of those people who died on that day, their purpose was done. And that could very well be, 
but it wasn't something that I was able to really process well. Mm -hmm. And um, and the how that manifested for me was with panic and with anxiety. And panic for me means I faint. Mm -hmm. So I was fainting all over New York City. I um, got tested, checked, cardiologist, nephrologist, every ologist, until one doctor was like, maybe you should see a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, you need to check my heart. You need to check my lungs. You need to check... And it was a psychiatrist just based on all of the, the, the various symptoms that I had at that time and had been having for a very long time, we came to um, all of those diagnoses and it's been a journey. So I have a question. So you said yeah. college. So about what age was that? Maybe 19, 20? Um, between 17 and 21. Between okay. 17 and 21. So I went to... Um, to college at 17 years and it was you know in hindsight i know that i dealt with depression from age nine and i only know that because of you know i have poems from when i was nine and some of those poems included um a suicide attempts mm -hmm. so i know as an adult that i dealt with it as a child but didn't have the vocabulary that i have now or the awareness that i have now and I'm sure um, even like the exposure to those conversations mm -hmm. as well. Like, you know what I mean? Because I'm thinking of like when we're growing up and then also not when, but where we're right. growing up in the right. Caribbean and, and kind of like what that looks like. There are no conversations. There's one label. The label is crazy. And that's it. That's it. Okay? You that's para. It. Yeah. Um, so as early as nine, mm -hmm. and that's from you looking back. Okay. So then now you're in college mm -hmm. now. What in college made you say something isn't right or something is a little off somewhere? I need to get this checked out. It wasn't me. It wasn't oh, me. Okay. It was, um, you know, my friends at the time urging me to go to, I think back then it was a the counseling center on campus. And back then they didn't have a thing back then. They didn't have language for it either. This wasn't something that was as widely discussed as it is, you know, right now. And so I just met with um, met with the priest, met with the on-site rep counseling representative, and just talked. And that was that was it. And it was them, uh, what made them suggest it to you. What was happening? I wasn't talking. I wasn't speaking. I wasn't sleeping. wasn't moving. wasn't doing anything. Mm -hmm. And they just pretty much was like, "You, you need to handle this." Okay. I also um, faint, was fainting in college as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in hindsight, I could see where I was having challenges. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I called it, oh, I was tired. I stayed up too late. Maybe it was an asthma attack. Maybe it was this. So now I know that a lot of the things that I thought were asthma attacks, they presented that way, but they mm -hmm. were panic attacks. So it's been, um, wow. it's been, you know, unfortunately, and, and I think the good thing about having these conversations is that, and why I keep having them is to ensure that no one else has to go through what I went through. No one else, it doesn't take someone 20 years to realize that what they think is a stroke or a heart attack or an asthma attack is really a panic attack mm -hmm. and they can get into, to treatment and recovery and, um, and, and get help a lot sooner than I did. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that, because I want to go back a little bit, around nine, and you mm -hmm. you use the um, piece of the journal. And so I'm thinking to myself, right? And this is someone who, you know, have never been diagnosed. Okay. Mm -hmm. So bear with me here. In my head, I'm thinking of when my mom would bust my behind, right? And I would be like, oh, I hate it here. I want to, you know, or you write it down. That this is, that's not the same thing, is it? No. No, okay. no. I mean, I actually still have journals from from sixth grade. OK, because I've been a, so I, you know, back then it was like, oh, I wore my frill socks today. I wore my school skirt with the boat. No, no we're not talking about um, I'm mad at my parents. I was a I was a good child. Okay. I, you know, okay. good grades. You know, I that wasn't it. But there were you know, poems that I wrote in school, things that I wrote in my journal that was just extreme mm -hmm. when I look back on it. And that's one of the, 
the, the symptoms, I guess, of, you know, bipolar disorder is extremes. It's, and so that's where mood stabilizers come in mm -hmm. is that, you know, instead of being a zero or a 10, a mood stabilizer would help you be at a five until you learn the coping skills to remain at a five. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, for example, you know, um, if you order, you know, your coffee and you want it with French vanilla creamer, but instead mm -hmm. you get hazelnut. For many people living without a diagnosis, that's not a big deal. You just go back to the counter or you loop around the drive through and you say, oh, hey, you yeah. know what, you give me, you gave me hazelnut instead of French vanilla. Okay. But for me, you know, some my mind would go to the extreme, like, you know, this is awful. Things are always happening to me. This is just bad. This is crazy. You should just unalive yourself. Okay. So it's the extremes that are the the challenging part of bipolar disorder. Yeah, I me. had I met a girl um, at a prayer group in church. Uh, when I was a Christian once. And I don't know, I just liked her and we kind of like mesh. Mm -hmm. And um, I tend to like people who are sort of like non-conventional anyway. And she kind of yes. came off like that, right? <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, you know, that's my girl, you know? Mm -hmm. And she ha was dealing with some stuff at work and I couldn't understand. I really couldn't. I was like, what is the problem? Like, yeah. not that big yeah. of a deal. And actually she told me, and she was the first person I know she wasn't the first person I met with bipolar. Mm -hmm. She was the first person that actually talked to me about being bipolar. And yeah. she was she was explaining to me the highs and the lows. And I want to get into that because mm -hmm. I want you to talk about, because I know there might be some people who are listening and they might be dealing with some something within their self, like they know, you know, but yeah. we will get into the stigma as well and all of that. But can you talk to me, <laughs> talk to me about the highs right and then the lows like what does that look like is it triggered by something outside of you or it can you just be chilling and maybe typing a paper and all of a sudden it comes on what does that look like yes it's it's both both oh, of those okay so highs can be the good high which is i've got extreme energy i'm cleaning the entire house i'm doing all laundry I'm going to organize the spices. I'm going to put my books in descending order. That's the high. That's the good high. Okay. But right after, and usually, you know, that's the high that many people with that diagnosis say they enjoy mm -hmm. because they can catch up on everything that they didn't do when they were depressed. Now, mm -hmm. on the heels of that high, that euphoric, that um, that that uh, that comes with sometimes delusions of grandeur. Like I'm gonna run five miles today. You know what? No, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna run to the next city. It's it's that that's the high part. But right after that comes the irritation, the irritability, the impatience, the lack of tolerance because you are likely not sleeping. And that's what it was mm. for me when I have that that high. I wasn't sleeping, and so after I've cleaned everything and done everything, I'm sleepy. I'm tired, but my mind isn't turning off. So I'm impatient. I'm, I'm irritable. And that's how it would look for me. The extreme lows, um, that's suicidal. That's mm -hmm. suicidal. That's su persistent suicidal thoughts. You know, I there was a point in my life where I thought about suicide every day, several times a day. Mm -hmm. That was just, I would daydream about what it would be like to not have those thoughts. And uh, like, you know, mentioned, is it triggered by something outside of you? Sometimes it is. Okay. It could be anything. It could be something that a person says mm -hmm. or does or their response to you. And it could also be nothing. So I recall, you know, one time going, waking up, going for a run, coming back, making my banana pancakes, making my eggs. And in the middle of making my scrambled eggs, I was like, mood shift. And I'm in bed for two hours, okay. eggs, everything right on the counter. I go to bed and then mood shift again. And I'm up and I'm like, all right, OK, we'll throw away the eggs, but let's make lunch now. And yeah. then mood shift again. So it was it was not only for me, my journey was not only understanding the diagnosis, but understanding how the di diagnosis affected me, because there's going to be similarities with people who have the same diagnosis. But because we're all different and we have mm -hmm. different experiences and events in our life, we're going to respond in different ways. And then I'm also an Aries. 
and I'm a middle child and I'm a woman and I'm a black. So when you factor in all of those things, the yes. way that I approach life is going to be different. I might be more fiery than, you know, than other people. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Because when you just mentioned the what came to my mind when you said the extreme low is sort of like the suicidal piece. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that came to my mind is like, is it because you mentioned you use the example of the coffee and someone they gave you the wrong, the wrong creamer to where that's now exaggerated in your mind. And so the first thing came to my mind, like, you know, uh, maybe something didn't work out that day. And so your extreme thinking is that, I don't want to be here anymore. Like it's almost yes. like the end of the world. You yes. know what I mean? Is, yeah. that, is that correct? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. It's catastro catastrophizing. Catastro okay. So everything is a catastrophe. The, there's no, there's no middle. There's no right. gray. It's either very bad or very good. There's no in between. So the responses to every life event is either very good, elated, happy, ecstatic, wonderful, or it's very bad. And this is the end and you need to just check out. And you know, with, with, with suicidal thoughts, suicidal, um, being suicidal mm -hmm. and having suicidal thoughts are two different things. Oh. Being suicidal is you have a plan and you're ready. Okay. You you know exactly you know exactly what you're doing, mm -hmm. and then being having suicidal thoughts or the intrusive thoughts. It's those you know what nobody likes you. Look how many people mad at you. Look how many people you know sent you nasty emails today. Look how many people aren't supporting you now. You in those moments you ignore the thousands of people connected to you on on social media that like you, and right. you fixate on that one person, that one experience, that one event, wow. and it's really hard to to disrupt the thought. It's got it has it's taken me a it's it's taken me work. I had to put in the work. Okay. To get to where I am now, where I'm able to to control it, because with suicidal thoughts and and being that low, that depressed, also what come with it and came with it for me was also self harm, and okay. so it's 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 like a compounded yucky jambalaya of of things that you know, if you don't have safeguards in place and, and people talk a lot about, you know, suicide is, a, is, is lazy, suicide is a coward's way out. <laughs> nah, if you've yeah, ever been suicidal, mm -hmm. you'll know that's not what it is. It's, yeah. You've lost hope. You've tried everything. Yeah. And, and when a person is at that point, they're not thinking rationally. And so empathy is what's required instead of judgment. So, so you, you just, um, whew, whew, you just said a whole lot. I'm, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still <kidding. laughs> okay. First, I'm going to, um, let you speak to India's question. She asked, mm -hmm. is it possible that people have these feelings? And I think that she, what she's saying is, but have, have not yet or have yet to be that. Yeah. But have absolutely yet to be diagnosed. Okay. Absolutely. Because okay. I had, ex I was experiencing, you know, symptoms before I was diagnosed and the diagnosis that I received was actually bittersweet. Mm -hmm. You know, it was sweet because it's like, oh, finally, you know, I'm not nuts. You know, there's a name, there's a there's a title, a label for what I'm experiencing. People have heard about it. You know, I'm not an alien. Thank God. But at the same time, it was bitter because there was a lot of self-stigma that mm -hmm. came with it and societal stigma and mm -hmm. shame. Like, wow, am I defective? Really? You know, is this, is this my life? You had, it was a mourning process for me that took several years. Like, what am I, what does this diagnosis mean for me? Does this mean I got to change my, my, my life, my goals, my dreams? I sure don't want anybody to know about this, you know? So it was a constant daily moment by moment awareness and, and performance to act normal, yeah. to act in a way that you know, wouldn't let people know that I was crazy because that's the word that, you know, society gives to people with mm -hmm. a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So being that you just talk about highs and lows and you talk about the extreme cases of those mm -hmm. um, and you you went to college, you graduated college, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, which means you, you were functioning in some capacity. 
Now, what about like employment for these extremes? Because in my mind, I'm miss. I'm thinking you missing work days and all sorts of stuff. So, how does how did that affect you, like in the workplace? Because you say you've done many things over the years. Has it gotten in the way of those, like your your um employment, your career at any time on your on this journey? <sighs> <laughs> oh boy. Um. Yes, that's the short answer. Yes. Okay. Fortunately for me, a lot of the careers and, and jobs and positions that I had, I was autonomous. So the work was dependent on me. I was a consultant. I was an entrepreneur. I was a coach, model, actress. It didn't require a team. Not but I can true. tell you that I've never had a team job. Mm -hmm. um, team where... I'm working with other people, a, a traditional, I don't even want to say corporate, but yeah, traditional corporate jobs. I haven't had one of those beyond a year, year and a half, just because the structure isn't conducive to me. Okay. Um, my life required flexibility. Understand that when a person is living, is, is living, dealing with symptoms of a mental illness, many times they're on medication. And many times that medication makes them so drowsy that being anywhere for nine o'clock is next to impossible. So I needed the flexibility of arriving at 10 or 11 and, you know, working until or working at nine at night. I needed that flexibility. Um, I'm also what comes with. I'm very I have. Man, you just asking all the questions. <laughs> I am. Um, so one one thing that I I, I deal with still okay. And, okay. and some things you know some of the the diagnoses I, I don't have any symptoms of right now mm -hmm. and you know we can get into that later but misophonia misophonia is an extreme agitation to certain sounds mm -hmm. not regular agitation like extreme like I need you to shut up right now and for different people it's different things for me it's like popping of gum, pen clicking, um, hearing a person breathe, mm -hmm. um, certain pitches of a voice or a cadence of speech, it vexes me. And I'm aware of that. So I don't have them near me, but I've got noise canceling headphones that I wore before the pandemic. If I was going to be working from Panera Bread or you know Starbucks or somewhere just to, to minimize the noise of the world because it, 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 it disturbs my peace. So I share that because in some work environments, even clicking on a, a keyboard is, was agitating for me. And so it was hard for me to be in those places. And then when you factor in, there were times when I was off medication, I wasn't able to manage my symptoms as well. And mm -hmm. so I was, um, impatient and irritable and the traditional corporate work environment here in America is not diverse, equitable, or inclusive. Mm -hmm. It's made for a person who can sit still and follow orders and rules. That mm -hmm. does not work for a person who has challenges with concentration or memory or daylight or, mm -hmm. or sunlight. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So um, yeah, short answer is there were gaps in employment. Um, and fortunately, I am <laughs> fortunately I'm smart and I'm an entrepreneur and I'm educated and I'm I'm a lifelong learner and I'm self-taught in a lot of ways and I'm creative and I'll I'll make something. Okay. Um, but okay. yeah. So so my question, I should have asked you this earlier. Now, the bipolar diagnosis, these things that we are talking about, your diagnoses, mm -hmm. um, is this like hereditary? Is this something that is in the gene pool? Or, mm -hmm. you know, tell me, do you, is this something that's in your family? Are you the first to be diagnosed? If I hope that's an okay question to yeah, ask. It is. Okay, go it ahead. It is. You know, I think the verdict is still out. Okay. You know, um, for some people, and, and see, mental illness, that, 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 that phrase, is just a catch-all for a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So for example, I do not 
believe, I do not agree with post-traumatic stress okay. being a disorder or being a mental illness. Okay. I think it's a mental health condition that humans experience when they have trauma. Mm -hmm. So whether you have been in war or you have you were chased by a dog mm -hmm. or a chicken eat your Johnny cake, <laughs> whatever it is, <laughs> you have trauma related to that event or experience in your life. That's a human response. I don't think that's a mental illness. Mm -hmm. So there's some people who have multiple people in their family with you know, a mental illness diagnosis and some who have developed a mental illness just based on their experiences and the events of their life, or there's a, a traumatic brain injury that mirrors depression or something else. So for me, I think, um, I used to think about it a lot, like, you know, is this hereditary? Is this, you know, just something that happened? I don't think about that um, as much anymore. I remember, I think it was 2008 when I was living in Maryland and I asked, you know, my God, a question like, why this? Mm -hmm. Why you, why you give me this? And the response that I heard mm -hmm. was, well, what would you prefer? Mm -hmm. And I, I That's didn't good. have an answer. Like what would, what would you prefer? That's fair. And so I and so I switch at that point from focusing so much on the why, why, why to all right, Natasha, what does recovery look like for you? How are you going to live with this thing? With How this. are you going to manage yeah. symptoms better? Because I did not want to take medicine for the rest of my life. I did not want to, you know, always be in therapy. I didn't want to to blow up and have those swinging mood sh shifts. I didn't want to do that. And so it, it took a lot of work on my part and, and I'm still working. So I want to shift and I'm going, I'm about to get in. I got a list of stuff, but we're going to get into dating as well, because I have some questions about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Actually, let's, let's talk about that. Let's so talk. I learned this um, recently. Uh, I was watching a documentary and then I was watching this series um, mm -hmm. and this had to do with the transgender community. Mm -hmm. And I never knew that some of them felt strongly about not having to disclose that they are transgender. I didn't know mm -hmm. that. I just thought mm -hmm. that, you know, cause it was a conversation about a lot of them being harmed when someone finds out. And some of them literally were standing their ground. Like I shouldn't have to tell you that I'm transgender. Right. And mm -hmm. I didn't know that was a thing. Mm -hmm. So when I was getting prepared for this and all these stuff, like uh, late at night, that question came to my mind and I'm like, I'm going to ask Natasha this, like mm -hmm. in your experience dating. Okay. Um, is that something that you feel you have to tell people that you are dating? You have to for, for Natasha, or... Natasha, yeah. it's an absolute okay. in the same way that you're going to know that I'm an Aries that I like, you know, um, cameo cookies that you're going to, that's part of, of who I am. That's uh -huh. part of my identity. You're going to okay. know that I'm from the Virgin Islands. I, and, and that's important for me because, so the question is, would a person with epilepsy mm -hmm. tell someone that they're dating, that they have epilepsy, that they could have a seizure? Right. Would a person that has asthma tell someone that they're dating that they can have an asthma attack and what to do in those moments. Mm -hmm. That's the same way I look at it because mental health is health. If I'm not ashamed to tell you that I deal with asthma or lupus or could have a seizure or could faint or whatever, why am I ashamed to tell you what my diagnosis is? Now, that wasn't always me because for a very long time I lived in shame and fear, mm -hmm. but now I'm not the crazy one if you have an issue with that. Like mm -hmm. I'm an adult and so I'm only engaging adults. If that's an issue for you, I'm not saying that you're wrong or you're a bad person, but you're just not the person to be in my life. That's it. No, we don't have to make a big deal about it. It's just, and, and for me, that's something that I, well, now I'm, I'm very public about it, okay. but I share that and I want to know, can you handle it? It's the same thing like a person that has kids. If you're dating, right. you tell the person right up, I got two kids. I got three kids. They're under 12. This was what I was diagnosed with. Okay. So, so connecting that with the, um, the part of stigma, 
has that get gotten in the way of your dating life like has there been someone that you were digging like you know oh i like him a lot and then you said that and it was like you know maybe you got ghosted or you know, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you i'm asking i'm gonna ask the questions <laughs> Yeah. Maybe no. Decide they're gonna ghost you. Okay. No. Okay. No, that's never happened to me, and I'm not. Um, I'm not going to ignore um, uh, some privilege that I have okay. um, relative. To, I'll, I'll just say we having a candid conversation. I'm not going to ignore that there's pretty privilege. I'm not going to ignore that I I have that. I'm not going to ignore that. But wow. um, I have okay. not. Um, I, if I looked, because I was in a, well, you know, Ooh. I've been in interviews before and I had someone ask a question straight up, you know, would you have, <laughs> would people have stayed with you if you weren't pretty? And, you know, that's a real question. That's a yeah, real that's question. Something here, Natasha, you know, went into something else that that's a reality because now I'm thinking of the people who look like, and I'm going to bring it back to the documentary about the, the transgender people, right? Mm -hmm. They have a term called passing in their community mm -hmm. that I learned about, right? Right. And that, oh my gosh, like the way that like, it's this it mirrors. where you're saying like, technically that's like a passing, like you don't look crazy. I don't look crazy. Whoa. And so I'm, I can pass. Yes. I can pass as normal. Yeah. And so it doesn't affect me as much. I can um I'm also a term that I hate that I loathe is high functioning. I'm not high functioning Ooh, yeah. because what that does when you say that oh you know um she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder but she's high functioning. What that ha what what when you say that it puts me outside the circle of empathy. Okay. Which was all of my 2021 that you know People with bipolar disorder don't wear lashes. They don't wear makeup. They don't wear four inch heels. They're not able to sit still in an interview. So we're going to, you know, I'm not going to be as compassionate as, as kind to her. I don't have to uh, bite my tongue around her because, you know, she's high functioning. She's not that bad. No, what you're seeing is me passing is me masking is is the the coping mechanisms and strategies that i've learned to control my symptoms mm -hmm. so that they're not as glaring around you and and that's what people don't get so no i've had one person that um that was interested in me you know a couple years ago that told me that i spoke about mental health and mental illness too much i bye i'm not gonna <laughs> stop i mean what you want me to do? That's like me dating a football what? player and being pissed that he's talking about football too much. Like, this is what you do. Yo, really? Well, you yeah. know what? Here's the thing. Okay. That, that's their own stuff. Okay. And I know that, fortunately, I know that people project. Yeah. And 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 people, people project onto you their own insecurities. And so if I'm talking about mental health and mental issue, whatever, all the time, mm -hmm. What they're what they're telling me is I don't want you to talk about that because you're reminding me of things I haven't dealt with, mm -hmm. or I don't want you to talk about that because um, it's an area that you're passionate about and I haven't found my passion. I really don't care, Hanifa. Yeah, I have lived and have gone through so much, and at this point, I release people in love. Yeah. If whatever you don't like about me, that's fine. I release mm -hmm. you in love. I. Mm -hmm. I ain't tripping about it. There's yeah. enough people on this planet. So no, I haven't had anyone okay. say that they're not interested in me because of what I've been through or what I deal with. Yeah. And you made it, you made a very, I'm so <laughs> glad you touched on that point. And like you said, we talk, we're two Aries. We're going to talk candidly. <laughs> right, and like, right. <laughs> you right. all understand. Yes. So when you said that, okay, we're going to talk candidly, there is some privileges. What of course. The other, because you mentioned pretty privilege. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that means that you're quote unquote passing. You don't mm -hmm. seem crazy. We don't have mm -hmm. to worry about you acting the fool. You know what I mean? Out mm -hmm. in public or whatever mm -hmm. that may be. Let's get in, before yeah. we get into the stigmas, do you know of any other privileges that people oh, absolutely. may not be aware of? Talk to me about those. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We all have privilege. Okay. I have, I was raised outside of the United States privilege. Mm -hmm. I have, I was, but I was raised in a U.S. territory privilege. Yes. I have, I grew up with two parents privilege. I was raised in a house privilege. I went to private school privilege. I graduated from college privilege. 
I, of course, pretty privileged. I've got degrees and certificates and I'm smart privileged. I have the she speaks so well privilege. I've got all of these things that these all of these things are privilege becomes an issue. Privilege in and of itself, whether it's something you are or something you were given or something you acquired in and of itself is not bad. It becomes bad when you use all of those things to lord it over another. So okay. me being you know, being what society may call pretty or beautiful or whatever, okay, in and of itself, it's not bad. But when I want to judge another or I want to 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 create hardship for another based mm -hmm. on my experience, that's when it becomes bad. We all have privilege. We all do. It's what we do with it that's the issue. Would you consider access to mental health resources? Because this is something that people think everyone has access to. I was talking to someone and I was telling them I had to kind of step back from constantly saying, because it's so easy for us to say, no, this is like a, um, a trendy thing to say, no, just go get therapy. And I had to kind of check my privilege mm -hmm. that everyone just doesn't have that access. Whether Period. we realize it or not, in this hair America, like that's real. So access yeah. to mental health resources, you consider that a privilege as well, right? One hundred percent. We could yeah. even take it take it back one step. Um, access to resources. Let's just talk free. You're presupposing that everyone has internet or has a smartphone that can access the internet, and they've got unlimited data. You're presupposing that. Yeah. You're presupposing that someone has a car or has money to take a bus to get to a library to get to these free resources. Then let's just go in the realm of insurance. You're presupposing that everyone has insurance. Then you're presupposing that everyone has insurance that will allow them to see a provider in network. 55% of U.S. counties do not have a practicing psychiatrist. Not one. And the weight like here in Florida, the wait for a psychiatrist might be three months. So all the, oh God, I just wish everybody would go to therapy. Okay, that sounds cute, right. but is there a provider in my zip code that has availability for me to see them? And when I finally get in, is there some synergy? Is this a person that I'm able to connect with where I feel like, feel comfortable sharing what I'm going through? Mm -hmm. Therapy many times is like dating. It's like going on a dating app. You know, the first one might be a good fit, <laughs> might be. And it's like, whoa, this is wonderful. All right, we cool. Yeah. But the first one might also be an absolute dud. Mm -hmm. And and that's then now you on to the next one. But many times people quit after that first experience if it's not a great encounter. So yes, access to mental health care is a privilege. And it's a privilege if you are able to. One of the reasons why I know I'm here speaking to you is because I went, I was in an inpatient, well, an outpatient treatment program for three okay. and a half months. Okay. I had great insurance that allowed me to be in this program three days a week from nine to three, group therapy, individual therapy, medication management strategies, coping skills, I mean, just everything for three and a half months. I learned not only about the diagnosis, but myself, how to cope. I had insurance mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. The reality is many people who could really benefit from what I went through will never get it because they can't pay out of pocket because they don't have insurance or they're on Medicaid or Medicare or they're on county insurance. So mm -hmm. they'll never get that. So we've got a whole segment of our population that could be contributing members of society, but because we haven't developed a system of care that can support them in their recovery journey, mm -hmm. you know, they just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, this is a good segue now because I was going to mm -hmm. say, um, let's talk about some stigmas. Cause you talk, <laughs> you talk about coming into 2022 and I know, I know Natasha, you don't, you, you're very passionate about this. So you don't really be holding your tongue for nobody. And I love, that's what I love about having the conversation with you. Um, not only are you someone who has a diagnose, has diagnoses, I'm correcting myself. Um, so this is your life. Yes. This is your life. This is your experience. You're not just yeah. talking based off of something you studied. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like this is, this, you're, you're literally living it. 
and you are very open in discussing it. So, you know, we talked about the crazy piece. Now let's get into some stigmas because you also mentioned mm -hmm. like things like in what they call intersectionalities, right? Where you, you're a woman, you're black, you're, you know, you have all of these different things going on. And I want us to specifically talk about the black community. Let's start there. Okay. Um, what are some of the <laughs> what are some of the stigmas? Because right off the bat, I'm like, okay, the term everybody jumps to, they're crazy. I know home where we're from. Um, and I still deal with this with my mom and the uh, older people, their thing is they usually just say someone gave them something to smoke or something like that. That's oh, God, usually yes. yeah. yeah. <laughs> they still they still say that to this to day. This day. Right. Yeah. And so that's one of the stigmas where it's like, OK, no, that person is just crazy. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me about some of the stigmas that we may not even be aware of, even participate in? Mm -hmm. Let's let's talk about some of those stigmas that people with mental mm -hmm. health um, diagnoses deal with every day. I don't even know where to begin. Mm hmm. I don't even know where to begin because there's so many. And I think 2021 for me was, was the, the awareness that I knew when I came out publicly in 2019, it was when I officially told my story and my mental health story. I expected that there would be maybe some pockets of stigma. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, 2019 and 2020, I went through unscathed. 2021, whoo, stigma reared its head in the worst possible way. Um, much of which will be in my next book. <laughs> much of which I, um, I'm still not even talking about because I haven't healed from it. And in order to in order to, I, I am a communicator and I know that a lot of what I went through is going to enable me to be better advocates for people and even to, to identify when stigma happens. But the first stigma is that I don't need rest. That's the first stigma. And you had a post either today or yesterday about you know this thing where our society seems to promote the hustle culture and they laud you if you're like oh I just work 92 hours straight I mean it, it's it's not it's not cute it's not cute and I know it's not cute because I was septic last March and April because I was in a in a a a a box I was put in a box and and I I would even say that I walked into a box where I don't get to rest where my passion for this cause means I go to the nth degree and I'm working 7 days a week and I'm thinking constantly about what I do um I hate and I rarely say hate but I hate the term strong black woman I hate it for the same reason I hate high functioning because I'm placed outside of the sphere, that circle of empathy and of compassion where I'm allowed to rest, where I'm allowed to take a break, where I'm allowed to get a breather. I came out of the hospital last year and today I focus on all of the people that did reach out to me, but people that I was interacting with every day said nothing, not how can I help? How can I support you? Now, I'm glad you're okay written on the back of a used napkin. What did I do with that? I learned that it is up to me to set the boundaries. That's my responsibility. No one is gonna say, Natasha, go to bed. Natasha, take a rest. Natasha, close the laptop. Natasha, get off your phone. Natasha, don't check your email. No one's saying that. That's my job, that's my work to do. And I am absolutely intentional about that and unapologetic, not sorry. I am going to take the time that I need to rest. I'm going to take the time that I need to, to reset, which is what I'm doing today and tomorrow this weekend. Cause I've been going, going, going all, you know from the start of the year. Um, one, that I, I don't need rest. Two, that I don't feel that I don't feel pain, 
And we know that our nation historically has a challenge with understanding that Black women feel pain from childbirth to, I mean, there's this research on that. I feel pain. I My feelings get hurt. I, Wait, I get frustrated. Natasha, I'm going yes. to stop you right here because we, mm -hmm. we're on to something right here. Okay. And I have to say this, when I decided to do this show, I should have asked you, but I was trying to find a male to actually join you, right? Because I know a black man, because I know, I <laughs> thought about you this. You want me to see if they're available? <laughs> <laughs> because I thought about it last minute. And the reason why is because I feel like even though there are similar um, experiences, they are definitely different experiences with Absolutely. black men and right, right. So, cause I've met some vets who deal with that stuff. Right. And anyway, but I, I did consider that at the last minute I was like, dang it. So if we do a part two, we both have a brother up on this panel with us for sure. Um, so shout out to the brothers. I have not forgotten you guys cause you guys are, this is just as much as an important conversation, but I want mm -hmm. to stay here for one minute because you brought up something that I didn't even really connect, which is the strong black woman trope and how that affects how people in our community, women, deal with mental health stuff. You get what I'm saying? Because I'm thinking if you know something is going on within you. I had a friend um, one time. I got a call that she checked herself into a hospital. Mm -hmm. I, they didn't go into details. All I knew is when I spoke with her, all I asked is like, well, what did you feel like that made you feel like you had to go? You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. she's like, you just know that something is off. And she, we know authorities at this point. So she's, uh, you know, she's not as young as you were, but it's sort of like, you just know. And I just felt like I was losing control of it. And so I just went and, and I was so, all I could tell her in that moment, Natasha, is how proud of her I was to be able to actually say that and say, take me to a hospital. Because that strong black woman piece will, will make us go take a, a, a leave and lie down somewhere. Go ahead. That was um, that was my October 2021. <laughs> Actually, that was my June through October. And I am grateful for the work that I've done prior to that season and for the people that I have in my life who check on me, who check in on me, who are a, a sounding board and a listening ear because 2021 was really heavy. And quite honestly, I thought the same thing. I was like, Natasha, you are, you're going to have to go into, into treatment. You're going to have to go to a hospital. And here's the thing now. So, and this is full transparency here. I am, you know, a professional. I am very public. I'm very open. And my first thought wasn't, Natasha, you need to pause and take care of you. My thought was, well, it's a sad commentary if you're so strong and you're breaking down. You know, it's like I didn't even, I couldn't even give myself the compassion that I give to others because of that strong, professional, always together narrative and box that I, I was pushed into and that I walked into. And so... Now coming into 2022, I'm better, I'm more open to giving myself permission not to be perfect. Okay. To be the poster child for mental health recovery. <laughs> I'm giving myself permission to have some days where I'm like, I don't want to talk. Up until yesterday, I had 137. Oh, look, I've got 167 text messages that I haven't responded to. In a previous season, that would irk my nerves because it's like, oh my God, I gotta get rid of them. Now, I will get to them when I get to them because I'm triaging, Hanif. And this is, I'm actually gonna make a TikTok about this tonight. <laughs> I'm triaging in the ER, they triage. So the bullet wound, the cardiac arrest goes in first. Your little sprained pinky finger, sweetie, I'm just have a seat. We're going to get to you. Okay. Did you see the two people we just wheeled in here? So I tell people all the time, chill out. 
Today in someone's life, you may be the cardiac arrest. Tomorrow, you are the sprained pinky. Everybody is dealing with heavy stuff. Everyone. I expect all of my friends to be busy. So when I text one of my friends, if they don't get back to me for one, two, three days, I ain't tripping. Mm -hmm. I expect you to be busy because I am too. Mm -hmm. You're triaging your life. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the space that I'm in right now. I am putting, I'm recognizing that not everything is urgent and important. So we, we, we have, we come from a culture, not just Caribbean culture, but black culture in general mm -hmm. of highly religious people. And <laughs> uh, you know where I'm going. And mm -hmm. usually when we're talking about mental health, because I think Baba, um, Baba Khalil, he put that in his practice, he said it is self-treated by drug and alcohol addiction. So when you're feeling those things, instead of checking yourself out, some people will what we call self-medicate. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, yeah. Try, yeah, try whatever works with them. Now, have you ever experienced like, I just need to pray harder? I don't know your religious background. Um, I, I need to become more spiritual, not even religion alone. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just be on Christianity, but just yeah. even, we're Aries. So there's yeah. that spiritual aspect there anyway. But yeah. I mean, like, you ever felt like I just need to be a I need to be more spiritual so I can overcome this? Have you ever experienced that? Yes and no. OK, so I grew, I was born Catholic. I grew up non-denominational. I've been in non-denominational churches all my life. I think. Let me see. When was it? 2016 for me, mm -hmm. I um, I went 2015, 2016. I went to Bible school. And for me, um, you know, again, full transparency here is one of the best and the worst things that I did okay. because I recognized that for me, for Natasha, um, I didn't agree with and align with a lot of the things that were taught. Mm -hmm. And so that led me on a journey where I gave myself permission to craft my own relationship with God, with my God. Mm -hmm. devoid of what I was taught in Catholic school, separate from what my parents told me, separate from anything and that anyone ever said, I have my own relationship with my God. And when I talk about God, I usually say my God, because get your own God. I'm my God's <laughs> favorite person, period. And so that's my spirituality. And my spirituality is mine. I don't talk about it okay. to people because it's intimate. It's okay. mine. Mm -hmm. In the same way, I don't post all my relationship business on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I don't talk about how I connect with God because it's what works for me. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone asks me a specific question, we can talk there, but it's mine and it's working for me. And so the times that I felt pressure to be um, more religious or more spiritual, to pray harder, that was external. That was external where, you know, um, in certain religions, they tell you that, you know what, there is no anxiety. And if you're anxious, you need to pray harder, you know, be anxious for nothing, but right. in everything through prayer and supplication. Okay, cool. Yeah. That sounds good <laughs> until you're having a panic attack or until you're dealing with anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been told to fast and pray that, you know, yes. I need to pray harder, pray more, all of that stuff does listen i don't want to hear it i don't want to hear it i like i said i've been to bible school i've studied several different religions i know what works for me and i encourage okay. people to do that themselves where i am spiritual and i wouldn't even say that it's pressure it's a it's a call and it's a draw i know when i need to spend more time meditating Okay. I know when I need to spend um, time journaling and reflecting and connecting with God more. I know when I need to to return to that discipline. And it's a long and it's a call that I have and that I do that. But external pressure, I really don't. I don't care what people think about me. I don't care what people think about my faith and spirituality, because here's what I know for sure. When I was in the hospital septic last year and had my energy, I was so depleted that I couldn't audibly pray. I had to connect with God in a different way. And it was my connection to my God that got me through that. It was the people in my faith community that prayed for me and, and sent the positive vibes and energy toward me that allowed me to come back from organ failure. It wasn't because I was in a building. 
Mm. It wasn't because I was doing certain things in a certain way. And so for me, I know that my life is the result of my relationship with my God. And I don't care what anyone thinks. So you just, you, uh, Rico just had a, asked a question about mm -hmm. like, uh, and maybe you might know of people who have uh, diagnoses, but they're not religious or technically like spiritual people. Do you know any people like that? And Absolutely. do you know what, kind, well, what, um, what would be there? I don't want to say coping mechanisms, but mm -hmm. they're tools that yeah. they reach for when they're having maybe low days. Do you know? Of any? Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, um, faith and spirituality is a recovery pathway. Mm -hmm. So medicine is a recovery pathway. Um, therapy, coaching is a recovery pathway. I know people who are not connected to any faith and they, they deal with mental illness. And mm -hmm. for some, they take medicine, they do the, you know, the traditional things for others, it's exercise. You know, it's swimming, it is, you know, being physically active, it mm -hmm. is being in nature, it's painting, it's dance, it's music, it's whatever works for you. Mm -hmm. I think the problem that we have in this nation relative to mental health is we're expecting a cookie cutter fit for everybody. It's mm -hmm. not a one size fits all. We're different. Good we have point. different experiences mm -hmm. and, and we are going to need different things and we should be free to, to, to chart our recovery pathway in a way that's best for us. So uh, I know we digressed a little bit and I wanted to get back into the stick. We're still on the stigma. stigma. Piece. Before, before I start letting people up on the stage, mm -hmm. I wanted to you to just discuss some other stigmas that people who may have mental health diagnoses deal with uh, like on a regular basis. And we may not even be aware of it. Just those of us who are yeah. not diagnosed. Mm -hmm. It is the, is she smart enough? Is she going to act crazy? You know, um, can she hack it? Mm -hmm. Can she handle it? You know, do, and, and then it works in, in the other way that if you're too strong and too capable you don't, like I said, get the empathy, the sympathy, the compassion. No one's talking to you about if you need a break. Um, I've even experienced in, in 2021 um, intentional attacks, intentional steps, intentional actions for me to decompensate. Mm. That there was an agenda. It was intentional. The goal was for me to decompensate. The goal was for me to end up in a hospital. The goal was for me to make a fool of myself and do a Facebook Live and, you know, just <laughs> blast everybody. <laughs> that was the goal. But I'm so grateful, again, for the people that I have in my life. And 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 that's the work. See, it, it's not enough for you to, to have a diagnosis. Okay. Okay, so what, you want the world to tiptoe around you because you got a diagnosis? Not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Everybody got something. Okay, if it's not mental, it's physical, it's emotional, it's it's whatever. Yeah. But I the work that I did and the work that I still do is to ensure that I have people in my life that can check me. That's one that can say Natasha, pull back. Too strong, mm -hmm. go for a walk. My older sister one day told me, You need to go outside and you need to walk and you need to scream until you get all of that out. Mm, I'm <laughs> and, so believe it. It is. <laughs> And, and you, but you need people in your life to check you. You need to have people in your life that have the permission um, to, to challenge you and to make you pause and to pull your collar and be like, yeah, you, you tripping, you know, or, or to say that, you know, you're a little erratic or you're talking too fast or you need to go to sleep. You need to have people in your life like that. And, and everyone isn't and cannot be trusted with that. That's, mm -hmm. that's sacred space. But the stigma is it shows up in where our intellect is, is questioned, where our cognitive ability is questioned, our stamina is questioned, whether we're volatile. You know, she yeah. can fly off I the handle. Say that. You probably treat it like you're so fragile. Oh, yeah. I wish. No, I wish. I wish Ooh. I were treated like I was fragile. I am Ooh. not. And I think it's because I am I am not. There's nothing about me that's weak. 
I mean, beyond, you know, we Aries. So we were the first of the Zodiac. We're strong. We're leaders. We're independent. We're, we're, we're independent thinkers. We're, we're leaders. So that's just my personality. And no matter what I'm going through, I'm, I'm, I don't do weakness. I don't do vulnerable. Those are things that I've said. But the reality is that just because I'm a soldier don't mean put me through war. Just because I can point. handle yeah. it yeah. doesn't mean that you, you, you dump it on me. And I think the other side of, of stigma is not just the she's crazy, but the we're going to make her prove herself every single day. Prove that you deserve to be here. Prove that you deserve a platform. Prove that you deserve to be amongst us. Right. Prove it. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. So mm -hmm. I want to get into the medication piece, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So before we get there, you mentioned something. Of, and when I used to work with, because um, I worked with a lot of uh, teenagers that were in foster care. So there's like a mm -hmm. lot of trauma. And then there was some mental health diagnoses and so forth. And one of the things that I would often see, and again, I think this has to do with culture as far as Black people is concerned. Th there was like a lot of minimization of what the diagnosis was for that teenager. And, and what would happen would be, now that I'm talking to you, I think it had a lot to do with their highs and their lows. So the parents would say, no, because you know she know what she's doing. You know, they, there's nothing wrong with her. And so they found it very hard to sympathize with them in their lows, simply because they're comparing it to their highs. Like, you were able to do this yesterday. What's the problem today? You know what I mean? Yeah. Sadly, parents are their children's, many parents mm -hmm. are their children's first bully. Sadly. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Sadly, many parents are their children's, their child's first bully. That they've learned that they are defective yeah. or that they can't be trusted or their experiences aren't valid. They learn learn that from their parents. Every time you tell someone how to feel in a situation, every time we say big boys don't cry, yep. what you're telling me is that the pain and the hurt that I feel in this moment is, is unacceptable to feel. And if I'm feeling it, then there's something wrong with me. And so a lot of parents aren't aware of the distinctions and the nuances between puberty Mm -hmm. you know, transitioning from, you know, preteen or your young adult to adolescence and, and mental illness, because sometimes they can mirror. It's just like a child having, you know, the terrible twos. You may think your teenager just feeling themselves, you know, they growing up some uh -huh. little boys or girls paying them attention. So mm -hmm. now they got an attitude or is it that they are dealing with some anxiety or having panic or depression, or there's a mood condition or, something as simple as they're grieving or something as simple as last night I was removed from my home. My mother went, my parents went to jail because they were fighting or maybe my parent died. So now I'm in this new home with this new family and I'm expected to go to school on Wednesday. Like nothing ever happened last night. Yes. Yes. Sometimes children act out because they don't have the vocabulary to articulate what they're feeling. Yes. And so it's not a, a mental illness. It's just their response to life events. Yeah, I I, I, I agree with you. I uh, When I was a trainer, because I, 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 I functioned in that capacity as a trainer, mm -hmm. and it was a very different side of child welfare for me, because now mm -hmm. I'm dealing with the people who are taking in um, um, the children. And one of the things we had to talk a lot about was uh, traumatized, what tra traumatization of children that when a child, just a child being separated from their parents is trauma. Yeah. Period. Right. Yeah. And, and it, you'll be surprised how many adults really couldn't understand that because in their mind, they're saying, right, but the parents were bad. So if the parents are bad and the children are separated, they thought that the children would be like relieved. And I'm like, mm -hmm. but, but guess what comes with that relief? Guilt for okay. feeling relieved. You know Absolutely. What I'm so there's so, it's such a nuanced conversation, and I'm glad you brought up the um, priority piece because a lot of times, and I, I, I'm the person that kind of introduced this into conversations because a lot of conversations around the ailments in the black community are very nuanced, and we're trying to have them in such black and white ways, and I, I just yes. feel like that's important. 
possible. So uh, we had a conversation once and I was explaining to someone that I use an example of a, a board, a, a guy, a grown man that I used to tutor and he was in his forties and I was tutoring him, trying to teach him how to read. He was reading at a first grade, second grade level. Now, we were having a conversation around like, no, these are excuses. And it's like, no, you have to understand that he had so much trauma that education, it wasn't even on the priority list. Mm. It was off of it. It now mm. it becomes, his mind becomes preoccupied with survival, period. Forget ABCs, forget one plus one, forget multiplication. None of that is important because I'm trying to survive my circumstances. That's how, mm. that's how somebody could be in their forties reading at the first grade level. These things Absolutely. are possible, but a lot of times we're so disconnected because a lot of us have these privileges that we don't realize are privileges. So when you just mentioned the priority piece, that's what my mind went back to that, you know, you start to prioritize because if, if your existence become about survival, you're not thinking about how to divide. You're just not. You're thinking you're about how do I get food on the table for my three younger siblings because my mom is in the room strong out on drugs. Absolutely. You know I mean? um, and even I, with, with mental health, you know, a lot of, for the people who like to push religion mm -hmm. as the solution, I recall times being in church where I sat through the entire thing. I don't know what the pastor said. Because I had so many thoughts going on in my mind at one time. Like I heard it, nothing. Then it's like, oh, just read the Bible. Just read scripture. Okay. I just read this verse 36 times. I still don't know what the verse said. Because I've got so many thoughts coming in. And here's the thing. Once a person who is symptomatic yes. leaves home and they, they're dealing with mood, anxiety, whatever, the priority becomes acting normal mm. so we're forgetting names we're forgetting dates forgetting to write things down because my priority is ensuring that hanifa thinks that you know i'm normal and that there's nothing wrong with me and she doesn't feel threatened by me and she doesn't feel unsafe with me so many people learn how to match and mirror so if you lean in then i'm gonna lean in if after certain sentences you shake your head i'm gonna learn to shake my head because wow. i want to appear normal so that you don't judge me so see some most people get to just go to work yeah they get to just go to the grocery store they get to just go for a walk when you're dealing with a mental illness you don't just get to go to work mm. especially if you're symptomatic you have to go to work you have to make sure that your words and behaviors align with whatever is normal for that culture when you add race and gender to it now you've got to ensure that your behavior aligns in such a way that you are non-threatening, okay? Because I, 2021, I cannot tell you how many times I was told that people are uncomfortable with me. Now, whether that I, it's because I'm just an outspoken woman mm -hmm. or I'm an outspoken black woman mm -hmm. or I'm, you know, major Aries energy mm -hmm. or mental health, whatever it was. Now I've got to conform and contort myself into a way so that people can work with me. These are the things that people aren't aware. It's exhausting mm. to deal with panic, anxiety, mental illness. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. And last year, my, my greatest concern, the last six months of 2021, was not reverting to 2015. That's how much pressure I had. Ooh. So every time you see me smiling, I tell people it's the Facebook fantasy. It's the Instagram illusion. When I take a picture, that's one second. Not yes. even a second. I can, anybody can smile. Yes, yes. But you're not, you're not seeing the weight that I carry of just being me, of mm -hmm. being, dealing with my, symptoms, my emotions, this last six months of last year, I had a resurgence of every symptom, anxiety, panic, fainting, mood shifts, depression. I had it all. Mm. And for me, because of the work that I've done on myself and because I know me, I know that it was not Natasha. It was experiences, events, and exposure. And I had to cut it all. Because I, 
I rather lose you than lose my mind. Woo, child, you don't drop so much stuff here. Okay, <laughs> and, and this is the thing: is like I was like, I don't even not when I don't even want to do a structured question with Natasha because I know <laughs> I've spoken to you more than once before, and I'm like, I know this is going to flow. Um, and I'm gonna you're gonna touch on some important points. Yeah. Last thing I want to touch on um, before I actually open up the stream mm -hmm. is the medication piece. Mm -hmm. Um, because one of the things that I know in working with clients who were on medication, um, a lot of them chose the option to self-medicate because of the, the medication that they were prescribed. It made them feel terrible, right? And I know you mm -hmm. talked before about like finding like, which, which is trial and error, it sounds like, like just like finding a therapist, you know, mm -hmm. finding kind of the dosage that works best for you or something of that sort. I think you mentioned, um, how, how has your experience been as far as the medication side of this? Were you, um, cause again, we're from the Caribbean. Um, were you like anti-medication in the beginning and did you get a raw? Okay, talk to me about that. What yeah. has that been like? Of course. Mm -hmm. First of all, in the Caribbean, we don't take, we didn't, I growing up, we didn't take medicines. No, we don't. There was a bush, there was a plant, there was something that my and mother Vicks. would make in and the Vicks. kitchen. And Vicks, Vicks and Buckley's solve everything, right? <laughs> so I already grew up with, uh, I we don't take medicine for anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't want to do it. And then I'm smart. I am college educated. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm not taking any medicine. No, I, I took it on a trial basis for the first time in 2006. And, um, and I took it reluctantly okay. as many people do, because who wants to think that they need a medicine to regulate their mind? So here's what I know now for me, medication buys me time. Yeah. It buys me time to come up with a strategy so I don't need the medication anymore. So after years of not being on any medication, and, and at one point in my life, I was on five. I was on a mood stabilizer, an antipsychotic, an antidepressant, anti-anxiety, and then I had one for sleep. So I took five medicines every day, and I needed them all. After being off of medicine for years, the second half of 2021, I was back on because I was increasingly symptomatic. Mm -hmm. I was, um, there's one time that I pulled over in the car right before I fainted mm -hmm. because panic attacks. I had daily anxiety and my mood was, was erratic. And here's the thing. Despite everything that I've been through over the last two years, I've, I've, I think I'm up to 13 people that I've lost in the last two years. Mm -hmm. Despite everything, life, pandemic, just everything, the pressures of being in my skin, mm -hmm. despite all of that, the one thing I was not was nasty. I wasn't nasty to anyone. There is no one that can tell you Natasha was just straight up nasty and mean to me over the last two years. Didn't happen. So understand the, the self-regulation and self-awareness required for me to contain the symptoms that I was experiencing to ensure that I could still put on, put my best face forward. Yeah, yeah pressure. Yeah. So I was back on, you know, I was back on anti-anxiety um, medicine last year because I was had a lot of panic attacks. And what it did was it bought me some time to, to reset, to separate from things and people and situations that mm -hmm. was contributing to my mental dis-ease. And um, fortunately now, you know, I, I started the year uh, without it, but I know that it's a tool. It's a tool in my wellness toolkit oh. that if I need it, it's there. Wow. I've never heard anyone say that. You talk, you're you talking about medication being a tool Absolutely. In, your, in your wellness toolkit. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so go ahead. I've got, it's too far, but I've got, you know, lavender oil is a tool to help me relax. Tea, walking, playing with puppies, crystals, um, <laughs> sage, 
you know, baths, all of those are tools. Think about it. When you have a toolkit, everything Mm -hmm. doesn't require a hammer. Sometimes you need a zip tie, but do you have a hammer in the toolkit? Yes. Yes. So medicine is like right now, you know, it's it's not a one of the tools that I'm using, but it's in my toolkit. Is is um would you consider like can diet help at all? Absolutely. Okay. One hundred percent. I your diet when I take medicine, I drink more water just because mm-hmm. I would just want to flush it out my system. Um, but what you eat can contribute to your mood. There's some times that I can't have coffee okay. because it's it's a stimulant mm-hmm. and it increases anxiety and panic. But then there's some times when I can drink it and it actually calms me down. Mm-hmm. So a huge part of mental health is knowing you. And the issue is many people are not a subject matter on themselves. I am a subject matter expert on Natasha. There's no one that knows me more than me. That's why I don't care what people have to suggest. That's why I don't endorse anything. If you see me endorse something publicly or on my face, know that I have used it, I've tried it, and I know it works. And people come at me all the time, magic bracelet, this bean, that tea, whatever. I'm not promoting it because... For you, it's a business. For me, this Um, is my life. This is your life. Absolutely. And self-medication is real. And I have done that like many people have. And the reason why people stop taking medication is because of how it feels. Yeah. I've had medicine that made me suicidal, homicidal, that gave me nightmares, hives, eczema, clenching of my, my jaws, um, numbness in my neck. Who wants to feel that groggy for, for after sleeping for 12 hours? So that's why people stop taking it. But what should happen is they should go back to their doctor and say, okay, can we work on the dosage? Or is there another medicine that does the same thing because this doesn't feel right? But in our society, people aren't told that they can actually be advocates for themselves. They're told to just shut up and do what the doctor says. Yeah, I love doctors. Gonna say, yeah, there's the um, there's that piece of the you know the doctor knows best, and then there's this whole magic pill idea that you know whatever you are prescribed that because mm-hmm. the doctor knows best, then that's what you're supposed to take, no matter how it makes you feel. And I'm so glad you brought this up because this is a very important point because you hear people talk about this a lot. Mm -hmm. But they talk about it in a way that the person is just being a stubborn, belligerent individual, right? Not really understanding that the side effects of the medication and how it makes the person feel really shitty. That's never put into perspective, right? Because you've had the conversation, well, you know, if she don't or he don't want to take their meds, what do you want me to do? But there's no conversation around why won't you take your meds? I've driven many like teenagers in my car. Who have said to me, you know, where the parent is like, you know, she's been off her meds for the last several months or something like that. And they'll be like, you know, and they'll curse and be like, I don't like that shit. You know, I feel like like I'm transforming into some to to a monster or something. Absolutely. Or they say it just makes me sleep all the time. I can't be productive on that medication. And these are teenagers where everyone around them is telling them what's best for them. Everyone yeah. around them is telling them what they should and shouldn't do. So there's no real self-advocacy because you have to feel some sort of empowerment to have self-advocacy. And a lot of people feel very disempowered Absolutely. in those positions because they are, like you say, they're so busy focused on not being outed to <laughs> so that they label crazy that yeah. it's just, a, it's a lot. So it's easy for us who don't understand to say, well, take your meds. That's that just should fix it. You're just being stubborn, not yeah. considering how the side effects of those medication actually make people feel. Imagine who wants to walk around that feeling like themselves. You know, it was interesting at the start of the pandemic, and and I heard this from many people, and I felt it as well when a lot of people were experiencing the overwhelm and were anxious because of what's happening in the world. For the first time in my life, I was like. Y'all get to see what I feel. Y'all get to see what I deal with every single day. And 
imagine this 24 seven, like you, y'all went back to work and it was alleviated, or, you know, you got the vaccine and it was alleviated, or you, you know, you got a new job and it was alleviated. Well, for some people, it doesn't just go away like that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think the last two years, more than anything, showed me that people talk a good game. They talk a good game, but every test that we have had as a society about mental health, we have failed. Naomi Osaka failed. Simone Biles failed. Every celebrity that comes out with any mental health, anything, what do we do? We pick apart. Well, is it really mental health? Because if it was mental health, then would you be able to do a TikTok? If it was really a mental illness, you were really dealing with anxiety, would you have been able to do that interview? We fail over and over and over and over and over and over again. So now we want to talk about why, but why didn't they just tell me they were depressed? Why didn't they just tell me they were anxious? Because you're not a safe person. That's why. You're not safe. Many people who put out things, cute things on, on social media, you're not safe. Right, right. Because you're not hearing me. When I tell you what I want to do or don't want to do, you give me why I can't do it. Well, here's a gem. Here's a scripture. Here's a meme. No, I need you to hear me. I need you to listen. So you brought up a good point because you are saying that, again, this is the nuanced piece where people don't understand that two things can be true at the same time. And two things can exist in the same space at the same time, right? Yes. Like you just, you mentioned Biles, the question. Well, I mean, for goodness sake, this is someone who won Olympic medals, right? Like, is she really, you know what it is, is Mm -hmm. that we measure mental health um, stuff by strength and weakness. Period. Period. And so if you are out there doing tumbles and cartwheels and flips, right, you're strong. Yeah. So there's no way that you can have any mental health, anything, because then that would mean that you would be weak. Right. That's really which, what's happening. Which is so silly, because when we look at the bravest, the boldest, the strongest in our society, who's that? That's our veterans. That's our active duty. Yes. That's our law enforcement, our firefighters, our EMS. Think about what they see on a day-to-day basis, and they're having a tough time. So if the strongest among us are having a tough time, we know that it's not about physical strength, but yet we continue to perpetuate that on the people that we say we love. Mm -hmm. And call me if you need me, tell me how it can support you. But when I tell you I don't wanna come to your party, you got an attitude. Mm -hmm. Tell me how I can support you, but when I tell you I just need silence or can you do this or don't push me or don't send me any more job postings or, you don't understand that. And, mm-hmm. and I think it's because we still, as much as we want to be individuals, we also want people to be the same. We want Very them true. to conform to our narrative of what normal is, our definition of what strong is, our definition of what successful is. Mm-hmm. You're not, you know, oh, if you, you, you got your, your little business. Well, you know, I work, I put in 12 hours today. I good for you that's I not need, what i need. I need you natasha to make me comfortable that's a lot of that i need yeah. you to make me comfortable yeah so that means that you need to conform to my idea of health wellness strength whatever that is yeah. i need you to conform and now when you don't conform it puts me in a place where i don't really know what to do with you because yeah when people, when people can't box you in they will prefer to discard of you than to actually deal with you for who you are. Because it's like, you that part box. And so I'm just going to have yeah. to get rid of you. <laughs> you know, I hear, especially a lot on Clubhouse, people tell me, you know, do you know you come off strong? Do you know you can seem harsh? Yeah. 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 Because I'm, I'm unapologetic. See, if you have had my experiences, some things... I don't waver on some things. There's no compromise with you disturb my peace. It's like sends through the hourglass. So are the days of your, that's the, your time in my life is numbered. I don't play. Listen, my peace. People are in one of two buckets. You're either contributing to my peace. You're making yep. me laugh. You're bringing me joy. You're making me making money or you are contaminating the peace that I already have. And trust me, 
if if you disturb my peace, if you mess with my peace and I don't do anything, don't trust me. Mm. Because it's a matter of time before you leave my life. There's it's it's coming. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not. And, and Hanif, I've been through too much. And I yeah. the reason why I keep talking about this is I don't want people to get to the point where they are septic or get to the point where they're having a, you know, a, a nervous breakdown, get to the point where they're sick because they didn't set the boundaries that they needed for their life. Self-determination says that you have a choice. You have a choice in the way that you allow people to engage with you. Yes. The rules of engagement for my life is that you are you come to me in peace. You come with anything else. It's a currency that I don't accept. And so I can't exchange with you. I can't exchange if you're not coming in anything other than peace. So check your tone. Mm -hmm. Check -hmm. your passive aggression. Mm -hmm. Check your bias. Check the narrative of me that you have playing in your head before you come to me. Because if I feel that, I'm going to self-select out of the engagement. Unapologetically. Una- oh, I-, I was about to hit that word because that's that that's the word that comes to me to describe you anyway. Unapologetic. Unapologetic. Um, and a lot of it is is growth. You do Without come to a, a place doubt. in your yeah, you get you come to a place in your life where it's just like you have to take the no nonsense approach. You have to set very clear yeah. boundaries. And when I set my boundaries, you're either going to respect them or you cannot be a part of my my circle. It's really that that's simple. It. The boundaries are in place to protect me and to Absolutely. protect you. How about that? That um, part. So I want to say this because I want to get into some things that we could do. Like those of us who, and like, and that's why you were seeing me kind of being careful in what I ask and how I asked it. Um, mm-hmm. I want to, us to get into, I don't want to say solutions, but just some yeah. things that we could do better in helping those who might be dealing with mental health um, issues in our community. Um, I just put the link in if you guys want to join the conversation Feel free at any time. It is now open. Natasha mm-hmm. does not bite. She just has very clear boundaries. I promise <laughs> you. <laughs> and, yes. and she's very open. Mm-hmm. You could ask her about her diagnoses, right? Yes. Um, as well. But I want us to start to talk about some of the things. Um, let me go through some of these comments from first, Natasha. Rico, I see you. I'm coming to you. Oh, someone says um, they will go to mental health, our people, black people. We'll go to mental health facilities for treatment. Well, white people. And then we will go to jail and never see treatment, which is true. Yeah. And that's the intersectionality. That yes. is the, you know, even in with, with black children, you know, mm-hmm. they are, are sooner labeled a problem child than they are labeled having ADHD or um, dealing with trauma. Think about it. I don't know what we're up to because I stopped watching the news, but we've lost 700,000 plus people in this nation. Each of those 700,000 is connected to at least one person who loved them. So there's Mm -hmm. at least 700,000 people that are grieving right now. Some of them are children. Are we addressing grief with our children? And in what ways are today's children that are labeled problem children actually acting out because they are hurt, Mm. because they've lost someone that they cared about, but we're labeling them bad? Yes, bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a lazy um, approach to addressing issues that a child might be going through. Um, Kim said, too many Black people have gotten killed by police because they didn't know how to handle a person with mental health. We've seen that. Um, I know there are people mm-hmm. who are advocating for social workers to become a part of the, the police department for yes. cases like that. I know that's yeah. something that a lot of people are advocating for. So when they get these type of calls, there is a, a social worker, you know, around mm-hmm. to actually come and, you know, they, they're actually trying to get those because the way that police are trained, they are not trained, you know, to talk you down off a ledge if you are yeah. you know what i mean so there's some yeah. advocacy going on around that um in my county fortunately mm-hmm. and I, I know this because i'm part of their crisis intervention training program which is in which informs the way an officer or a deputy interacts with a person that's having a behavioral health crisis whether it's substance use mental health or a cognitive disability like autism down syndrome mm-hmm. whatever and everyone in the department the hillsborough county sheriff's department is trained in CIT 
And I watch and I see the interaction and the positive outcomes that it has had. Now, okay. here's the thing for Florida, the way the law is written, when there is a mental health call, uh -huh. the deputies have to show up if it's a Baker Act and it's different titles in different states. But right now they have a behavioral resources unit that allows you know, trained mental health um, providers to accompany deputies on a mental health call and they facilitate the conversation because mental health is a health issue. Yes. It, sh it shouldn't be a law enforcement response. It's a, yeah. It should be a health response. So yeah. hopefully that will move across the, um, the nation. Okay. Hey, Rico, welcome to the stage. How are you? I'm doing well, Hanifa. <clears throat> this is a great conversation. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm one that's well needed and uh thank you natasha for educating us and you know giving us an inside view to uh a unique person who has your you know unique perspective because i've never sat down and actually talked to anybody that i that i knew of that actually that that was open about their mental health issues so you know most people as Sanifa said earlier they're private about it and they're more uh you know, it's, they don't they don't share with it for everybody. So you, mm -hmm. you you open my eyes to a lot, and I really wanted to ask you a question, as much from your advocacy side as much as you know your personal side, because mm -hmm. I I've run into a couple of conversations as of late, and is there a difference? I I, I think you didn't really say, but like I guess your mental uh, challenges just came from birth, like nothing happened to you. You just were born to have certain uh, the diagnosis that. You felt like I'm trying to figure out: is there a difference between a person who maybe who's just born with mental health challenges, as opposed to a person that maybe a traumatic event mm -hmm. caused them? Because I've run more into instances where, unfortunately, a woman maybe has been sexually assaulted. So, and they have mental, you know. So now it, it's brought on, mm -hmm. or just a wider range of things. And then those, it's just like you're really trying to understand, like. It, it seems like the, the 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 effects, the medicine, whatever is the same, but they're brought on by two different things. Like one mm -hmm. is naturally maybe a chemical imbalance, and one is an event. And how do you are they handled the same? Are they treated the same? I'm just trying to get some insight on that. So the difference is, um, you know, a mental illness versus something like post traumatic stress, and and post traumatic stress is when there's been an event or an experience that cause trauma to the individual and they're having you know adverse effects so that again could be you know like our veterans who've gone to war it could mm -hmm. be you were in a car accident you were chased by a dog um you know or assault the symptoms of trauma and mental illness can be similar the treatment can also be similar Okay. However, there is no medicine on the market to deal with trauma, to erase trauma. Mm -hmm. Trauma is something that has to be processed. So any medicine that a person takes for post-traumatic stress is only to buy themselves some time to go get therapy. It's mm -hmm. only to buy them some time to process the memory and process the experience because there's no medicine on the market to wipe your memory. And that's what trauma is. You had an event, there was an experience, and you're having a tough time because you're constantly getting the flashbacks of what happened. Well, short of that thing from Men in Black that erases your memory, there's no medicine on the market to do that, and it has to be processed. Now, with a mental illness, with a diagnosis, the medicine can stabilize moods, can decrease um, symptoms of a, a, a panic attack, can... Um, help stabilize the highs and the lows. And so the medicine function differently, but they can be used in both cases. Wow. Okay. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty interesting when you think about it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess, I guess the first step is trying to identify where, where the individual falls, you know, are they in victim of trauma? Or are they a victim of mental illness? And do you, or I, both. I, or both, yeah. And is there is there a lot of miss, you know, like oh, we're treating this guy like they got mental illness, and actually they have mental trauma, or we're treating this person like they have mental trauma? No, they actually have mental illness. It's kind of hard. Well, almost impossible. Or substance use. 
because if a person could get pulled over for a, a DWI, DUI, but are they addicted to alcohol or have they been drinking all day because they learned that if they drink all day, then they can sleep at night? So it's, it's and, and substance use and mental health or addiction and mental health are so closely related. That's why I tell people, don't judge someone who's dealing with an addiction. You don't know their journey. Because there's no one in the history of ever that has been bored and said, you know what? I want to get an addiction this weekend. No one has said that. So anytime someone is dealing with an addiction, it's been, you know, by accident. Maybe they experimented one time and that was the one time that threw them over the edge. Or it could be someone who got into a car accident, had how many surgeries on their back, lost the job that allowed them to keep having these surgeries, now they're still in pain after their 30 day supply has ended. And so they turn to street drugs because the pain is that excruciating. So there's a level of empathy that's baked into these conversations that I just don't think we have enough of. I, I, I definitely, definitely agree with you there. Wait. Lack of empathy is crazy. Yeah. Nico, so let me, let me touch on, I have two people that, okay, so Awa, she just mentioned that the trauma causes the mental illness. Um, tra trauma, in my opinion, is a gateway drug. Woo! Okay. Oh, wait, Can wait, we wait, start wait. there? Yeah, stop, stop. Can we just stop? Wait, one minute. Woo. Okay, say that again, <laughs> Natasha. And trauma yes. is the gateway drug. Trauma <clears throat> is the gateway drug. When a child experiences, and there's ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, when a child experiences trauma and it's never addressed, mm -hmm. so then they become an adolescent with trauma that's unresolved, unprocessed, an adult with trauma. They go through life with this trauma and they develop coping skills for that trauma. So um, they, it's just like me saying, you know, well, the reason why I'm so fiery is because I'm an Aries. Well, no, Natasha, some of it was because you were, you know, manic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we create stories around our life experiences because we haven't processed the trauma. Trauma is the gateway drug. Trauma is the reason why people start, oh, I'll just have a beer after work. Then two beers, three beers, happy hour, just on Wednesdays. Then it becomes, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Then it becomes every day in the week. Then it's, I'm picking up a six pack every night. Trauma, the things that we refuse to deal with. And, um, in my book, I've got a quote that says, you cannot expect people to ignore the things that you refuse to confront. Mm. We're not blaming the person for the trauma that they're experienced. However, I say after 24, after 26, it's your responsibility to handle that. Mm. You know well, that you're dealing with something. You cannot expect people to ignore your attitude you're drinking, you're, you're drugging, you're partying, you're gambling, you're shopping, you're whatever it is, just because you went through something. At some point, you got to hit the pause button and go get help. Good point. And that, I just wrote that quote, trauma is the gateway drug, because I, it, it's, it's funny, it kind of, I felt it when you said it, because it resonates. I know that it's a fact. You know what I say? I, I, you, you're talking about yeah. You know, people say, oh, weed is a gateway drug and all that. And I'm like, but why? What is it that they're trying to suppress? It's pain. It that they're, right. So the, uh, the real gateway drug that y'all, if y'all want to really talk about it, is trauma. It's but trauma. I want, I want to get to Victor. Victor had a question for you. He said, from what, I, from what I've seen, no one should be taking lithium. The side effects are too great and long lasting. Do you agree? It depends on the individual. Okay. Um, lithium is one of the most, um, it's been around for a while and it's still prescribed. I'll tell you what I did. I, I, it's too far for me to grab. I use, I have gemstones and crystals. Mm -hmm. And in my quest for recovery, one of the things I was looking for everything, I was going through everything against the wall to see what sticks because I was that serious about my recovery journey. And I found a, a crystal, a gemstone called lapidolite, which actually has trace amounts of lithium in it. 
And uh, I bought it and I carried it with me. I slept with it under my pillow. Did it help? I think it did. I think it, it, it stabilized mood for me and I kept it. And for me, that's where the, I'm going to do this my way. I'm going to chart my own course for recovery. I'm not going, I, I may ask Hanifa, okay, so what did you do here? Mm-hmm. But if it doesn't work for me, I'm going to do what works for me. I tell people all the time, if you tell me that staring at a lizard for five minutes every day keeps depression at bay, I'm going to pick some flowers for your lizard. I'm not married to one recovery pathway. Mm-hmm. I want people to have peace. I want people to be well. I don't want people to be well my way. And that's the issue that I have with religion. Many times, you know, people in religious organizations want people to experience peace and wellness through their method of God. No, I don't care. I don't care what your method is. I just want it to be healthy for you. And whatever it is, I support you in that. It sounds like a lot of that, ta- that takes a lot of self-study, like you said in the beginning, where you have to become the expert of yourself um, yes. from what I'm hearing. But mm-hmm. I wanted to get into, you talked about your passion for vets. Mm-hmm. And I think we have, Rico, yeah. you're a vet, right? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> we have a we have a vet. I've met a whole number of vets in this in these youtube streets yeah. um and some of them are my uh, they're some of my favorite yeah. people actually um yes. but what where does your passion because I, I i told you for the longest because of your passion i actually thought you were a vet but yeah. now you just tell me today i learned something new. <laughs> absolutely not so where did your passion around mm. the veteran community come from why why is that demographic like so important to you i I think I've always, you know, um, liked the military. I think my love for the military came when I was in the intensive outpatient treatment program because um, a couple of my groups were with active duty military. So I had Army, Marine, Army, Marine, and Air Force. And uh, the first day I walked in, they were in uniform. And I was like, oh, they're going to ask me to leave. But they didn't. And we shared and talked um, freely. And I learned a lot from them about uh, mental tenacity and just the training that they go through in order to be um, in the military. And that was something that I held on to. It was it was a lot of the people that I was in that program with, I still communicate with to this day because we, we bonded through our shared experiences. One of the you know greatest influences of my life who's no longer here was a Marine that taught me mental tenacity and the importance of handling the assignment, dealing with the emotions later, the importance of, of sometimes you you won't always be able to change your circumstances, but you can change your perspective, your outlook on it. You can change the story that you're telling yourself about it and find, find where, where are you, where can you be empowered? What can you control and affect in this moment? Handle that. Everything else that you can't handle, leave it alone. And so I do work a lot with, with, with veterans. That's, um, that's just a population that's 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 near to me, that's dear to me. And because of some of the things that they experience, you know, post-traumatic stress for a long time was only discussed in the context of military. You know, it wasn't it brought into people who are in car accidents and all of those things. So I think the experiences that especially combat veterans had and the trauma that they experienced and how closely their symptoms mirrored my own. It just was a, a natural um, connection and bond. Mm-hmm. You're muted, Hanifa. <laughs> Wait, no, you're still muted. <laughs> you're muted. Okay, sorry. Yes. So I was it's saying, okay. I know we're coming soon to the ending of our time together, and I will bring you back. Um, it will probably be because I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to utilize the month of February. So it'll probably be in March, um, but I definitely want you to come back with sure. a man 
a black man so that we can have part two. I got this. one for you. I know you do. Oh, I know. I, I thought about it at the last one. I said, Lord, have mercy. And I know you knew someone, but that's yeah. okay. We're going to get a part two in there. We're going to have a brother up on this stage because I think that is important as well. But I want to get into, talk to, talk to us like we don't know anything right about uh the the mental uh people with mental health challenges right mm -hmm. we're unaware and so we might ask stupid questions or we might um have certain conversations in in front of them that is just mm -hmm. offensive right tell me some of the i know tell me some of the things that those of us who may not deal with these challenges what are some of the things you think that we need to be aware of that they are very important and then also speak to me about some things that we can do if we know someone because i feel like sometimes we know people we just don't know mm -hmm. um or we might even have an inclination that they might be dealing with some things what mm -hmm. are some things that we can do to help and assist them i know i asked two questions. yeah no it's okay the mm -hmm. first thing is to know that this isn't a joke Okay, so any joke that you may want to tell relative to mental illness and mental health, drop it. It's not a joke because this is what people live with and deal with every day. If we're not joking about a person having cancer, like, oh, that's that cancer chick. Oh, she's still dealing with that cancer. Oh, God, every day she whining about her, her chemo or radiation. If we're not doing that, I don't want to hear it about depression, anxiety, panic attack. The second thing is you don't have to be deep. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be smart. You just have to be present. So I don't need you to give me a gem, a pearl of wisdom. I don't need you to drop any knowledge on me. I just need you to be present. I need you to hear what I'm saying and respond to what I'm saying, even if it is to say, I don't know what to say. How can I support you right now? The next thing is your language. Language is so offensive. You know how offensive crazy is when a person is already feeling crazy? It's as if as offensive as call, saying fat around someone who is aware of their weight. You just don't do it. It's bad taste. And, and the, the, the challenge that I've had with our society over the last two years is a disconnect between how many people talk about community and how they demonstrate community. You don't demonstrate community because if you do, you would care about me. You would care about my feelings. You would care about what makes me hurt. I don't need to break my leg to know that it hurts. Empathy says that if a person hurts, I don't need to have felt that pain to care about them hurting. I just care that they hurt. I've never had children. How ludicrous would it be for me to tell moms, are the contractions really that bad? Like really, like you're really that, you're really in all that pain. Oh my God, you're so extra. But this is what is happening every day when people invalidate the experience. If, if I say I have anxiety, that's not your opportunity to say, well, what are you anxious about? It's just us. If I say, you know, I'm having a low energy day or it's a depressed day, when people say that, that's not your opportunity to point out all the things that they've got going on in the eye. Well, you got a job and you just got a promotion and you have a car and you have your children that loves you. Depression, anxiety, panic, sometimes it can be situational. Many times it's not. So when you are, are, are countering a person's truth, what you're saying is, I don't believe you. I think you're making this up. And there's no way for you to sit in a place of support and invalidate my experience. It's the same thing with race. You know, when Black people say, okay, this is what I'm experiencing, for anyone else to say, well, oh, we had Barack Obama, you're invalidating my experience. Just hear me, sit with me right here. So things to support people, um, listen, just be present. You know, I thought that the, the pandemic and the shutdown would have slowed people down enough to really care and hear, but it hasn't. It's actually made them want to do more in less time, which is bananas to me. Just sit with what I said. Sit with what I said. Sit with what I said, not what you heard. Sit with what 
I said, and, and, and don't be so quick to rush me to a solution. And that's true for grief. There's many people grieving. I'm still grieving. You don't have to tell me, give me all the foolishness. Well, you know, God wanted his angel. You know, heaven sent for them. They went on to glory. Their assignment was done. Like, ain't nobody trying to hear all that. <laughs> we don't want to hear that. Just say, I can't imagine how you feel. What can I do? How can I support you right now? What do you need? What can I get? And when you have no words, zip it. Zip it. But stop trying to be deep. Stop searching mm -hmm. for things that, that, that people don't need. You're making it worse. And you're mm -hmm. basically raising your hand and saying, I'm not safe. That's what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's very interesting. First of all, I'm mad at you that when you was talking about the God piece, you were rocking like a deaconess. I'm just mad at that. <laughs> You like it's right now, like those, those girls, deaconess in church. Okay, I that's what happens. Thing, <laughs> that's what happens, and it's so it's so vexing and and annoying and invalidating because it's saying that you know me better than me. Yeah, yeah. and and that's so rude. Like, really, you think that everything, every experience can be boiled down to, you know, one sentence that you extract from a yeah. any book. Yep. I'm not saying that it, it, it's not true. I'm not saying that scripture is, you know, invalid. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that when a person is hurting, for you to come back with anything other than I hear you, I feel you, what can I do, is disrespectful to their experience. Stop it. That's you know, what I'm saying. You just said a mouthful. Rico, were you saying something? Because I felt like you said something and then. No, I was just laughing at the rocking and the deaconess thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the things that you said that, you know, as I grow um, in my own spiritual journey, I, I'm learning that, you know, it's people sometimes just want to not feel alone in the world. Period. And that's just a matter of you being present. Like They don't want anything from you. They don't even want your words of encouragement most of the time. They just want to make sure that they're not alone in the world. And what does that mean? That mm. means that we have to be present. And present yeah. just means that active listening. Like, no one is asking you to come and drop no gems or no knowledge. Like, just be there. Because the reality is that a lot of people who are dealing with, like, mental health challenges feel alone. They feel alone. Oh, yeah. That was my, that was the last six months of 2021 for me. And here's the thing. Um, ally, that word, that hits different for me. Okay. When I, with, with my history and my background, I wanted allies last year with my experiences. But here's the thing about ally. I can't declare myself an ally any more than I can declare myself a Q or a, a, a veteran. No, I didn't go through it. You know, that is something that is a title that's given to you based on the, your, your actions. And, and being an ally is courageous because sometimes it's inconvenient. It means you're going to have to speak up for someone else you're going to have to apply your privilege the privilege that you have in in service or in to help another and many people don't want to do that because it's it's inconvenient and they don't want to be called out for you know being a disruptor and so you know a lot of people talk that support game but they're not ready for it they're not ready for it like i know that everybody isn't a support for me and can't be a support for me because for you to be a support for me means that you're coming to me accepting and knowing who I am and you're ready to advocate for me on the level that I am. And sometimes that's going to be uncomfortable and inconvenient. And it's OK if you can't, but don't pretend that you can. Yeah. And that's what I was just going to say, that a lot of it is just being uncomfortable, especially when their cookie cutter approach doesn't work for you. People really don't know what to do with that. And a lot of it is just how we're socialized. We we are looking for uniformity, right? Yeah. Oftentimes, you want, we want people who think, who talk, who act like us, because that 
makes us it makes life easier for us let's just be real um but i want to answer this question real quick and i'm gonna go through mm -hmm. some comments um where can simon find your book natasha it is on amazon provoking mm -hmm. thoughts volume one i don't know does this show forward or backward for you backwards backwards okay so it's <laughs> I, it's actually printed backwards but it's provoking thoughts volume one 101 inspirational uh inspirational quotes for daily life um you could also send me a message if you want to have one that's autographed or signed you can send me a message on facebook or instagram and then i'll i can i can mail it to you but it is on amazon you can get it just natasha middle initial a pierre provoking thoughts and you'll you'll find it there and i've got another book that is coming out that's too far for me to <laughs> to grab <laughs> But um, I haven't decided if I'm going to have that come out for spring or for my okay. birthday in April. Okay. But it is, um, it's about the experiences of my life that allowed me to develop the confidence that I will overcome anything. That no matter what comes my way, I'm confident I will overcome it. And it's it's the resilience, in my opinion, is the missing component for a lot of our youth. Mm. that and and really for a lot of people that they aren't confident that no matter what comes their way they'll be able to handle it and so they self select out of opportunities and self select out of life sometimes yeah. Yeah. because they haven't had the people to encourage them and they haven't had um they haven't been shown and taught how to develop that that resilience so more on that later Okay. Um, I will ask the question. I know you were talking about validating mm -hmm. um, someone's experience. And she asked, does everything have to be validated? Like even delusions? That's her question. No. And it, no, but you have to, it, I, I tell people when you start with love and you start with empathy, it really can't go wrong. Because I've been with people even in a, a delusional state and they were still able to connect with me through my empathy and love for them. So yeah, no, you're not going to affirm that there's a purple cow sitting on the living room couch, but the love and, and empathy, you know, you, you don't speak to that, you speak to something else. And, and this is why we need more mental health providers. Our universities aren't churning out and giving scholarships, in my opinion, for people to enter these professions. We are woefully mm -hmm. understaffed in this nation with mental health providers, woefully. We need more, we need more trained people. And for families, mental health first aid, um, there's mental health first aid for adults and for youth. If you're gonna take one, I recommend taking the mental health first aid for youth because you will understand the differences between you know, puberty and mental illness, you'll learn how to recognize the signs. And that information is, you know, applicable for adults. But everyone needs to have some awareness of the warning signs of, of suicide, the warning signs of when someone is experiencing a mental health challenge or crisis. We need to know that because, you know, the stats aren't getting better. Yeah. You know, we know that in especially in the black community over the, um, the course of the pandemic that drug use has increased. We know that suicide attempts have increased. People have been in a pressure cooker for the last two years. And so when you have a pressure cooker with um, changing rules relative mm -hmm. to the pandemic every day, with this being the worst group project in the history of group projects, because everybody ain't pulling their weight and doing what's necessary for the collective, it's 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 stressful. And people are living in a state of, of stress. And so we need more coping strategies. We mm -hmm. need more information on how to get through a day that feels heavy. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things, and, I, and we're about to wrap up, but one of the things that um, came to my mind as you were speaking, Enrico, if you're not any time, feel free to jump in. But first, I want to say, if you're here and you're listening um, and you're liking what you're hearing, please make sure you go back out and subscribe, um, share, hit the like button. Um, this is what this channel is about. 
I try to bring conversations that are either going to provoke us to become best version of ourselves or are going to provoke some sort of thought around healing with mm-hmm. us within ourselves and then also as a collective. Um, and this conversation is no um, different. But when you were just speaking, Natasha, what came to my mind is how the Black community, how we deal with each other as far as not just mental health, not mental illness, but just like um, just pain in general. And it's it's the approach oftentimes, because we do this with our own children as well, mm-hmm. um, just get over it, right? So there's that, there's that stigma that we didn't talk about around that mm-hmm. you could help it if you really wanted to. Yeah. You know, you're not so trying you're, hard you're, enough. You're not trying, right. You're not trying hard enough, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's very heavy in our community, not just with mm-hmm. mental, just in general. Yeah. You know, people, we talk about <sighs> the grind culture, people not being able to rest even when they're not feeling well, you know, because yeah. I, I, for me, I said a lot of it, we've been called lazy for so long in this country which we know is a lie, but we've been called right. lazy for so long that a lot of us have this internal battle within ourselves to where we know we need to rest, but we're so afraid of being perceived as lazy and unproductive. Mm. And so we would rather kill ourselves, right, than get the rest that we need. And that's yeah. something that we have to deal with within ourselves as Black people existing in this society. There is this yeah. like cloud of um, judgment you know, um, it's almost like an indictment of laziness on us, right? That Mm -hmm. black folks is like, they know they're having these challenges and they refuse to slow down because the reality is like, I'm not lazy. I'm not, no, you're not lazy. You just need to rest. Yeah. You're you're literally having a breakdown. So there's that stigma of if you wanted to fix this, Natasha, if you wanted to get better, then you would. Yeah. The reason why you're dealing with bipolar is because you want to deal with bipolar. Isn't That's that basically it. as well in our community? Oh, of course. I mean, it's everywhere. It's like, oh my God. You just, you know, everybody wants an excuse. Everybody have a diagnosis now. You know, that and that's not the, the case. Let me tell you something. There's nobody that I know that would choose anxiety, that would choose depression. It doesn't feel good. And so, yeah, do some people, are some people um, married to their diagnosis? Yeah, just in the same way some people are married to high blood pressure or diabetes or any other ailment. But the reality is that people want to be well. And I saw a comment from Quantum Love about metaphysics. Okay. Metaphysics is 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 a huge part of my my wellness. Okay. Um, one of my I love books by Louise Hay, and there's a lot of yeah. authors about metaphysics. But there is a a you know there's a there's a mind and there's a brain. Mm-hmm. Your mind and your brain are two different things. The brain is the physical thing that's in your head. Your mind are your thoughts, your imaginations, your intellect. Yeah. Um, that's what that is. Yeah. And when it comes to mental health, they work interchangeably. Yeah, you can um, take medicine for for brain chemistry, mm-hmm. but if you have stinking thinking, if you're connected to people who who verbally abuse you, if you're connected to negaholics, people who who just love to be negative, mm-hmm. no matter how much medicine you take, your mind is still going to be a hot mess. So metaphysics and 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 just positive thinking, reading, doing the work, Hanifa. Yeah, we yeah. got to do the work. Like I cannot yeah. be expected to, and I I've released myself from being responsible for everyone's mental health experience. I triage that there was a day where I'd be every day I'm running, you know. Save trying everybody. To, trying to save the world. Uh-huh. I can't. I can't do it because I was septic and I'm not doing that again. So I triage even what comes into my my world, what 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 people need help. I'll delegate, I'll tell give them the resources because I also need p- people to participate in their recovery. In the yeah. same way that I'm journaling, reading, praying, meditating, walking, drinking water, doing all of that stuff, and I gotta continuously do that, mm-hmm. I can't save anyone. Yeah. I'm going to be drained if I put all of my efforts toward it, giving everyone a prescription for their recovery when they're the subject matter expert on themselves. Mm-hmm. I don't know you like that. You gotta do mm-hmm. the work. So there are no shortcuts, pretty much. None. Zip. None. 
There's none. There's no shortcut for your mental. Is there a shortcut? Listen, if I do four squats right now mm-hmm. and, and five sit-ups, I'm not going to have the, the banging body that, you know, <laughs> that I want. What, what, what people don't understand when they begin anything, first of all, is you have to count the cost. You have to consider all of the setbacks that could come up along the way. And you have to commit to the journey. It's you're not just doing one act and then getting the results. You don't just mm-hmm. take vitamins today and then you have health for all eternity. It's a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Your mental health is a lifestyle. That's part of your day. That's resting. That's sleeping. That's you know positive conversations. That's reading. You know, it's the same thing with physical health. You just yeah. if I eat crap every day and mm-hmm. I do one sit up, really. And, and you you don't understand why you don't have the six pack abs. You're not doing the work. And many people, because mm-hmm. we don't want to slow down and because we've been conditioned that we cannot slow down, yeah. we sacrifice and we're racing against time, hoping that our body and our mind doesn't break down before we reach that X number of dollars in the bank. Mm-hmm. Nah. I'm not doing so that. So I know, um, Rico, before we wrap up, because I, I have one last question, I'll let Natasha wrap us up with the last question. Did you have any other question for Natasha, Rico? No, nah, I've just been sitting here and learning. And I just did just want to take a moment to say, um, I thank you for your courage, you know, for sharing your story. Uh, I thank you for your advocacy, especially for the veteran community. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thank you for, you know, imparting your knowledge and hopefully... You know, I've learned something and I'm an older, I'm an old man. I thought I knew everything. It just makes me think about my relationship with uh, some of my children. And, and, and you know, it, it, it struck a chord with me when you said your parents are your first bully, because I know mm-hmm. I've had a struggle with one that, yeah, I'm guilty. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I can't, the time is gone. He's an adult now, but I just think about that. Um, and I just want to say, I'm proud of you. I'm very, very proud of you for mm-hmm. sharing your story, the advocacy and what you're doing. And keep doing what you're doing. I think you are a beautiful lady for the way that you're uh, putting out this message. And and especially in our community, we need it so badly. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Can you continue on teaching? I'll be quiet now. Thank you. All right, Rico, thank you. Natasha, I'm going to mm-hmm. let you wrap up with just telling us, because I feel like you've told us throughout the conversation. But if you could just wrap this up by telling us... Mm-hmm. I know this is not where you're residing. It's probably just currently where you're at because mm-hmm. it is a journey. Yeah. Tell us where you're at right now on your mental health journey and the things that you're finding that's like working for you. Like, you know, like this, this is my, this is my tool right now. This is yeah. where I'm at, whether it's meditation or whatever. Tell us where you're at on your journey. Talk to us about the things that you've had to learn to accept and the things that you refuse to accept right and the tools that are actually working like really working for you at this at this point go ahead well i'm happy to say that i'm in a much better place than i was the last six months of last year mm-hmm. and um, i had to make a decision in october to choose me and i made a i told myself i said natasha i'm going to treat you i promise to be to you and to treat you the way that you treat your friends Because the reality is, you know, I haven't been a very good friend to myself in past seasons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, the the medicines that I had to take last year, the anxiety, the panic, a lot of that that I was experiencing every single day, I chose me and I got rid of some people and some things and some situations and associations and was able to start the year uh, a lot better. What's working for me right now, the first thing that comes to mind is music. Music soothes me. My my playlist is everything. I got everything. Country, rap, I music, calypso, everything. Music is working for me right now. And sometimes when I don't have the words to articulate what I'm feeling, you know, a song can do it for me. And so music is working for me. Um Stillness and quiet is working for me. Honesty. Honesty is working for me. Being 
and and I'm not even gonna say brutal honesty because I don't think it needs to be brutal, but I'm honest with what I want and what I need. And I'm giving myself permission to not compromise on that and not feel bad for it if it doesn't meet up with what someone else wants and needs. I'm honest about when I need rest. I'm honest about when I need to pause. I'm honest when something or someone doesn't feel good. I don't care if everybody like you. If I don't feel you, I don't feel you. Done. I'm, I don't need any reason why. And it's not even from a defensive standpoint. It's offense. I'm playing offense right now. In years past, it was defense. I was reactionary. Now I'm on offense and I am doing what is necessary for me and adjusting in the ways that I need to adjust. I am sage works for me. You know, sage resets. Um, I love the, the, the smell. It's cleansing. It's purifying. I incorporate that into my meditation and prayer. I have lots of, of crystals. Um, as far as apps, you know, I have apps for the full moon because, um, you know, lunar, moon, lunacy, they, they link. So I know when the moon, three days before the full moon, three days after the moon, I know that I'm going to feel a little different. I track my menstrual cycle because sometimes it's not mental illness or a diagnosis. Sometimes it's just life. Sometimes it's hormones. Sometimes it's just, you know what? You don't like to hear people pop their gum, whatever it is. So I am, I'm in a, I'm reading a lot. I started off this year reading. Um, I've got some books that I'm looking at on, on grief when you're not okay. Um, uh, lots of books. That's what's working for me. And last year it was a lot of audiobooks. You know, um, I I give myself the freedom to to do whatever I want that is best for me. And I I most importantly, Hanifa, I don't it took me a while to get to a place where I'm so unapologetic. But I'm here and I'm not getting up off of it. I really don't care about what people think of me and my life. I really don't care. I've been through too much that someone not being happy with the way I choose to live my life and what brings me peace. I don't care. It's that That's a, a personal issue, a personal problem. My peace is paramount and that's what's working for me. I, I pursue peace. I pursue peace. I manifest peace. I, I, I look for the peace in, in every situation. And if the peace isn't there, I'm out. I'm going to head out. I'm going to head out. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Natasha. Um, like I said, I will be bringing you back. Um, you usually make yourself available, and I appreciate that about you. I am so grateful for that. Um, I I wouldn't have this conversation with anyone else. Um, I am so serious because I, you know what it is, is that you touched on it earlier, is that when, when someone sees you, I can see people having very offensive conversations around you because you'll never guess. Like we talk about passing. You know what I mean? And I, I'm like, this is the person I need to talk about this. Because mm -hmm. when she tells a story, some people are like, yo, I would have never thought that. And so, you know, and then I know that you're real passionate about it. Who else to have to come and talk about this than someone who actually mm -hmm. lives it every day and, and can articulate it in such a gracious and sophisticated manner? I appreciate that about you. I already told you, you're like, one of my favorite people on social Thank media you. anyway. And I was dying laughing when you said music because I said, uh-oh, she up on her Patrice. Drink water. Listen, I, that's it. <laughs> yes, that is it. Drink water. Mind it. And you know what? Even that is a recovery pathway. Uh -oh. Drinking water and minding your business. That helps with your mental health. Drink water, <laughs> mind your business. Because when you mind in your business, you're not Oh, no, I saw you. Um, I saw your reel and I bust out laughing. I said, you know, that that song is a whole lot of people's <laughs> therapy right now. I'm telling you, it's like a reminder every day, ma'am, ma'am, yes. just drink your water and mind your business, okay? 
So when I when you said music, that's the first thing that because I saw your video yes. um, that you posted yes. about that. But I appreciate you, Natasha. Um, I look forward to bringing you back. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna touch base with you about the guy and see yes. if we can make that happen. Um, it'll so happen. Have, okay, it'll happen. It'll so we happen. can have both of you guys on, and we're gonna talk about part two. Um, and I want him to talk about stigmas as a black man and what that looks like and so forth. So again, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Rico, thank you for coming up and contributing to the conversation as usual. And again, to my audience who is always here supporting, always here building with me. I appreciate you guys. If you know anyone that can benefit from the channel, make sure you send them over and subscribe. If you haven't, go ahead and subscribe. Next week, we have another great show. Um, and then, uh, the month of February, we are going to be talking about these black children and what we need to be focused on. Okay. <laughs> so until next time, peace. peace. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.